Here we go. <laughs> And welcome to the Junto Cast, a podcast presented by the bloggers at EarlyAmericanists.com. I'm Ken Owen, an assistant professor of colonial and revolutionary American history at the University of Illinois Springfield. Today on the podcast, we're donning our red coats, humming God Save the King, and drinking tea as we discuss the question of loyalism during the American Revolution. And to discuss this topic, I'm joined by two guests. Um, The first is a man who can regularly be seen cheering for European mercenaries in red coats representing the City of London. I'm talking, of course, of Arsenal fan Michael Hatton. Hello, Ken. Michael is a PhD candidate and teaching fellow at Yale University. And we're also pleased to be joined today for the first time by a man who has signed more conflicting oaths of allegiance than all the inhabitants of New York City combined – I'm talking, of course, of Christopher Minty. Hi, Ken. Christopher is Bernard and Irene Schwartz Fellow at the New York Historical Society and the New School. The question of loyalism during the American Revolution is a subject that has received a lot of renewed scholarly attention in the last few years, questioning exactly how far the population of the 13 colonies did enthusiastically support the revolutionary cause. Traditionally, historians used the estimates of John Adams that about one third of the American population were enthusiastic revolutionaries, one third were loyalist, and one third was somewhere in the middle. But this has come under more scrutiny and has been a lot more attention on the question of what actually made someone a loyalist. How far did you have to give support to Britain to count yourself somewhere within the loyalist camp? And so today on the podcast, we're going to be addressing that question directly. Who were loyalists? What is it that made someone a loyalist during the Revolutionary War? We're then going to look at the question of those who actively supported Britain during the war itself. And then we're going to take a turn to look at what happened to loyalists after the War of Independence, what happened once the Treaty of Paris was signed, and in theory, America stood on its own two feet as a country. How did those who had wavered in their loyalty to the Patriot cause get treated by the new nation after independence? And finally, as always, we're going to talk about how we might approach teaching the topic of loyalism within our own courses. But to start off with, we're going to pick up on that question of what is loyalism and who were loyalists. Chris, I know that you have quite a lot of thoughts on this. Yes, uh, thanks, Ken. Um, over the since the 18th to the, the 21st centuries, there's you know, a shifting sort of definition, a perception of what a loyalist is, who loyalists were, and what loyalism is as a social political phenomenon. And if we start in the, the 18th century, loyalists were kind of synonymous with, with governors, with people high up in this, on the civil list, with attorney generals. And that's largely due because a lot of people that were given their sort of employment by King George III in Parliament became loyalists. And so immediately after the American Revolution, loyalists are portrayed as Tories, they're portrayed as against sort of American progress and American sort of progressivism. And then as the the 19th century moves on, loyalists are forgotten about. There's not much uh, history that's been done on them. Uh, This changes in around sort of the middle of the the 19th century. When a historian called Lorenzo Sabine, um, he does some biographical sketches of thousands of loyalists and he publishes them all, and it's just a biographical scrapbook, really. And it's just a list of who they were. And from then, up until about the 20th century, there wasn't much done again. And then from the 20th century, uh, Alexander C. Flick wrote a little book on loyalists from New York, and he said there were seven categories of loyalists, um, and he divided them up to royal governors, there were lawyers, there were merchants. But he said the most numerous people were sort of people of ordinary means, And from Flick up until around the middle of the 20th century, there was kind of a renaissance in loyalist studies. And Wallace Brown and William Nelson were leading this renaissance 
Uh, Wallace Brown said they were conscious minorities. And then Wallace Brown from Mining the Loyalist Claims Commission said that they were mostly farmers. And from then up until around now, the shift on focusing on loyalism has changed, moving more towards Atlantic loyalism, so the people who left the colonies. Um, so it was kind of an active statement of who loyalists were. If you were a loyalist, you left the colonies, and that's how you could be sort of defined as a loyalist. Uh, sort of more recently, though, it's become a bit more difficult because some people's research has shown that people were changing sides. At one moment, they were a loyalist, and then they were a patriot. And that kind of complicates how we define loyalists and what loyalism is. So we'll come back to that question of changing sides in a little bit. One of the things that I think really stands out from the summary that you've given there is just how diverse loyalists were. That you know, we, we can go from people that were appointed to some sort of position of government, to lawyers, to merchants, to farmers, to ordinary citizens, that in some ways what you've described is the American population. So is there anything that particularly stands out as something that might make someone fall into the category of loyalist? For me personally, to be a loyalist, someone has to make a to do something towards to actively sort of enunciate their loyalism. I can't, I don't think there's a particular type of loyalist. You can't classify someone because of their occupation as a loyalist. I don't think a farmer was any more likely to become a loyalist than a tailor. Um, I think it changes the number of sort of loyalist farmers, and the number of loyalist tailors would vary from place to place from an urban center to out in the a rural countryside. Um, religion comes in and that plays a role as well and that's something that my research has gone into is to determine sort of the religious diversity of loyalists and how many were anglicans how many are presbyterians and that's been quite striking because if you read a lot of correspondence sort of during the revolution from loyalists they're convinced that it's it's a religious war and from research that i've done of about 11, 1,200 loyalists from New York City, about 85% were Anglicans. Well, I think you've given us a very clear definition of who loyalists actually are. And I find it particularly fascinating that you mention religion so much, especially with my work being on Pennsylvania and that question of Anglican loyalty coming up so often. But I think here we focused quite a lot on loyalists, and yet, when we talk about the American Revolution from the Patriot side, we talk an awful lot about ideology and the beliefs that drove people to revolution. Um, so one of the things that I wondered was, is there a similar sense of what loyalism is as an ideology? You know, can we only identify a group of loyalists, or should we be looking to try and define loyalism closely as well? Right. Well, I mean, this is a, this is I think it's, has been a significant problem in terms of loyalist studies uh, for a long time. I mean, it, when we think about defining patriots, like Ken says, you know, we often think about um, arguments about patriot and republican ideology. I mean, the, the idea that you can define uh, patriots by the fact that they subscribe to some shared set of ideas, and I don't think we've ever had that really firmly established. Um, on the loyalist side, there has been a, a sort of idea of uh, Whig loyalism, which was coined by William Benton in the, the late 1960s. One of the problems with Balin's argument is that it didn't really account for someone like William Smith of New York. This is like colonists who held Whig principles throughout the imperial crisis, who effectively argued for colonial autonomy, but who in the end couldn't bring themselves to sort of make the jump to independence. And what Benton did was he basically did a bunch of character studies of these kinds of men. And he came away uh, arguing that the, these Whig loyalists were mostly upper class men who sort of feared that independence would, would upset the standing social and political orders in the colonies. And Smith is an excellent example of this. I mean, in the 1750s, he's a contributor to the Independent Reflector, which offered some of them the most concise colonist authored statements of uh, colonial Whig republicanism. And Smith was critical of British imperial policy reform, uh, 
But when 1776 came, he couldn't bring himself to support independence, even though uh, his fellow two contributors to the Reflector did. In fact, he remained committed to working toward reconciliation even after independence to such an extent that many of his old friends stopped talking to him. Some even thought he was a bit crazy. Uh, it, it, it's the fact that, you know, when you're in this moment of upheaval, uh, Smith really tried to avoid taking a side and, and it very much isolated him. And I think uh, one of the takeaways from that is that it's very hard to judge from one's previous actions, whether it's the 1750s or 1760s, that, that that's no guarantee that you could predict someone's actions at the, the revolution's sort of real moment of truth in the spring and summer of 76. And it's also a good reminder that these were individuals, right? They're individuals within communities and social and political networks, to be sure, but primarily individuals making individual decisions with all the sort of self-interest and contingency that that implies. And I think that's a large part of the reason that historians over the decades have talked an awful lot about patriot ideology, but have been much less successful at narrowing down a broader loyalist or Tory ideology. I think there's probably at least one other factor, which is that in the same way that it is dangerous to write down outright statements of patriot ideology when you fear that the British might be imminently invading your territory. You know, we certainly see this in the actions of many in Philadelphia in 1776. Most of what we know about what goes on was not publicly available, was not necessarily public knowledge at the time. But it was also incredibly dangerous to identify yourself as a loyalist, especially if there weren't any British forces anywhere near you. you know, how we would actually recreate that loyalty, you don't get the same voluminous outpouring of supporting the status quo because American patriots from the very early days of the imperial crisis are very fond of using intimidatory tactics to those who are willing to defend the British regime. And I think another thing that is important within why it's hard to define loyalism is it's something that history is largely defined negatively. I remember when we recorded our episode on the Declaration of Independence, basically we came to the conclusion that if you couldn't find anything in the Declaration of Independence that you agreed with, that probably defined you as a loyalist. But again, it's defining you by what you're not standing for, rather than something positive that you're standing for, because ultimately it's the status quo. You, you don't necessarily need an ideology to defend the status quo, um, unless it's coming under a certain amount of sustained attack, but then you don't necessarily have the time to develop it, because there's all sorts of other intimidation that might prevent you from doing that. Right. I mean, in some sense, you know, some some of the criticisms that you get from uh, loyalist historians, which we'll talk about later, uh, that you get after the war is the fact that Britain had failed over the course of the 18th century to really create um, strong imperial institutions in the colonies. And in some sense, you know, that might have been a, a, a uh, that might have been one of the means by which you might have created uh, that kind of sort of a more loyal sort of imperial ideology that did not end up happening in the, in the way that Ken is talking about. What I think is quite important is that when the colonies are all starting to rally together and sort of, and protest against Parliament as a unified entity, people that were either against it or kind of apathetic towards that, they were still within their local communities, very much committed to their own lives, their own towns, their own communities, their own colonies. They weren't going to unite with somebody sort of in, if someone's up in, in Georgia, they're not going to unite with somebody in Maryland for this to protest against the content of Congress because they're committed to, like, as you said, retaining the status quo. So I think that kind of undermined loyalism as a movement because there, there was no unifier to bring them together. They're all quite desperate. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the other thing is that you know, if we say that there's, what, 80%, 90% opposition to the Stamp Act you can still believe that British government is the best thing for the colonies and disapprove of the Stamp Act. 
you can still believe that British government is the best thing for the colonies and disapprove of the intolerable acts. Uh, that actually a lot of the opposition, certainly in the early years of the imperial crisis, comes from the viewpoint of people that write as His Majesty's most loyal subjects. And so it's not until we get to 1773, 1774, that there's that many people that are being directly forced to take up the issue of which side do you support? Because prior to that, actually, it's perfectly consistent to say we want British government, we just want British government in accordance with what we understand to be British principles. Right, absolutely. I mean, that's an effective, effectively, that's the Whig loyalism position that Benton was trying to talk about. Uh, it's a good reminder that, you know, there's a difference between sort of royalism and loyalism, right? And I mean, in some sense, you know, you can argue that there's no such thing as a loyalist before 1776, right? Until you're fa – that it's the fact that you're faced with the choice of independence for the colonies or uh, support for the king and parliament, that, that it's that decision that is what makes someone a loyalist as opposed to – uh, whatever they had been during the imperial crisis leading up to that. So it seems that we're coming to what is quite a strict definition of loyalists. And it's, it's certainly something that I would have a lot of sympathy with as well, which is to say that unless you have taken some specific action that identifies you as on the side of royal troops or parliaments once the Revolutionary War has broken out, it's very difficult to describe someone as loyalist. But I raise this question because it's my sense of recent academic writing that there's been an attempt to look at loyalism in a slightly broader sphere and to look at loyalism as something that is maybe a little bit more sentimentally defined rather than simply practically defined, and that there may be people that in the past wouldn't necessarily have been considered direct loyalists, but have been close enough to giving some support to British forces that their sentiment is enough for them to fall into a category of loyalism. I mean, why have you both taken the side of very demonstrable practical support? for loyalism to be attributed to an individual. Throughout the, the early years of the revolution, especially British forces were sending correspondence back to parliament saying that there was, most people were loyalists and they just needed to tap into this groundswell of support and then loyalists would just rise up. And one of the ways in which they did this is which when the British army occupied territories, such as urban centers, they got the local inhabitants to take the oath of allegiance. Now, in my own work, I looked at New York and I found oaths of allegiance for Kings County, Suffolk County and New York City. And what they would do is they would transcribe all their names, their ages, their occupations, and they would send them all back to Britain. Now, this is, this is all well and good. This is what I used in my dissertation to identify loyalists. But if you go back a bit or if you go further a bit, the same names start cropping up in documents that would contradict what would seem like their loyalism. For example, if we go back to 1774-1775, I was finding a lot of names of people who would later go on to sign the Oath of Allegiance, they were signing their names to the Continental Association. To complicate that even further, nearly everyone that was in the member of the Brookhaven Committee of Safety in Suffolk, nearly every member took the Oath of Allegiance a few years later. And some of these 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 men were in charge of per persecuting loyalists and sending them to the Provincial Congress in, in New York. And a few years later, they were signing the Oath of Allegiance. Does this mean that they were they were loyalists? I, I, don't, I, I don't think so. Because if you go back and you can read their rhetoric in the minutes of the committees, then they're quite clearly not in support of British government. Now that begs the question on how much influence the British army had and how they sort of got them to sign these lists. And we'd certainly find something similar in Pennsylvania. There's an excellent little book by 
Francis Fox on Northampton County in Pennsylvania that looks at the Northampton County Committee of Safety. And he has very similar experience that there is a... The chairman of the Committee of Safety in Northampton County dies shortly after independence um, under great pressure from the new Committee of Safety because he's refused to take an oath of allegiance to Pennsylvania. And Fox's strong suspicion is that ultimately the person who was chairman of the committee that pushed Northampton County towards independence ended up regretting his decision and probably, probably wishing that there was still a connection with the Crown. And that that change is something that's really difficult to actually pin down, um, either in terms of ide ideology or in terms of any sort of political definition. You know, how do we deal with people that change sides quite so readily? I think it was, and with the Pennsylvania example and the New York example, I think it happened all over the colonies. Now, I, 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 can't, I don't have evidence to back that up, but I think if research was undertaken on other urban centres, so Newport, Charleston, Philadelphia, maybe even in Boston to a certain extent, that you'd find people changing sites. And whether or not the, the other Oath of Allegiance were administered, I, I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised if they were. And I wouldn't be surprised if you find large-scale evidence of people changing sites. Right. I mean, you have sort of uh, another place where that plays out in a, in a sort of similar way, but not necessarily through um, through written oaths, I mean, is New Jersey, which acts as this sort of uh, crossroads of the, the, the war itself in the middle Atlantic. And, you know, some, some of the anecdotes that you have from the time are basically have people saying that um, they outwardly supported whichever army was closest at the time. And I mean, that's, that's hardly surprising. You see very similar things in... In Philadelphia, the people that clearly stayed behind not wanting to forfeit their property to British troops, but hoping that if they kept their head down enough while the British forces were there, that they wouldn't get into too much trouble if Patriot forces recaptured the city, and sort of trying to play both sides of the fence as closely as they possibly could. Um, I mean, that, does, that doesn't strike me as particularly surprising in terms of being a historical phenomenon, that people will follow the path of least resistance. But I think it does at least explain in some sense why there might have been an attempt to move towards this question of loyalist sentiment. Now, Chris, I know when we were at a conference in Halifax, Nova Scotia over the summer, you developed the or sort of voiced a notion that maybe we could talk about different tiers of loyalists, um, according to how consistent and how vocal their support was. Um, do you still stand by that idea, or is that something that you've thought more about? Yes, um, I, remember, I was listening to the last podcast, and I remember you were talking about different tiers of, of founders, and it, it got me thinking again of different tiers of loyalists. And I still think it is useful so to give an example a tier one loyalist would be someone i always use the example of charles ingalls charles ingalls was assistant rector and then rector of trinity church in new york city he wrote several loyalist declarations that people would go on to sign and he was put in charge of a newspaper in new york city to publish these declarations he makes continual statements in favor of british governance and he acts upon them on multiple occasions he doesn't leave the colonies during the revolution. He stays in and around New York to try and mobilize loyalist sentiment. A tier two loyalist might be someone that stays in an urban center and doesn't really do anything, but then signs a document indicating that they might be a loyalist. Now, a tier three loyalist might be someone that switches sides. It, you could add as many numbers as you want, but then if you add too many, then it becomes counterintuitive and sort of just a bit silly because you could have tier 10 loyalists versus a tier one loyalist and then how can you have a loyalist that's tier 10 do you have a tier 10 founder 
the, the sort of loyalist that no one wanted. That the, yeah. the, the British sort of sent running back to running back to the Patriots. Going, you're not enough help to us. You know, please, you're of no use to us anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what makes it even like more difficult is people who leave early on in the revolution. So Miles Cooper, president of King's College, now Columbia, he leaves very early on. Because he leaves, he doesn't really do anything to try and mobilise loyalist sentiment. So is, is he, he is, he's presumably a loyalist. He left. He didn't come back. He wanted to, but he didn't come back. But he didn't do anything to mobilise broad-based support. And someone like James Delancey is the same. James Delancey left and he didn't come back either. Whereas he could have been a leader in sort of the loyalist movement. And because of that, that offers insight into loyalist leadership. Were there any leaders there charles ingles might have been one yeah joseph, joseph calloway might be another at least in coming back and serving as mayor of philadelphia yeah um during british occupation but i, th I think and i think that points to another thing that e even if we sort out loyalists into separate tiers it's a starting point for further research and for further investigation because it doesn't necessarily tell us why loyalism failed or what loyalists believe. It just helps sort out the relative importance and where we might like to focus more research on in the future. Hmm. I think it's difficult to incorporate overarching frameworks to loyalism because it's so difficult. It's so different in every single place. So sort of my how I get around that is I look at particular communities, really small communities, and examine the political behaviour of its inhabitants and see how, what they did. And then from that, you can use their behaviour and compare it to other areas to see if there's a similar pattern. But I think it's really difficult to do a broad-based history of loyalism in the American Revolution without going into micro-historical case studies. I think one area where we can point a little bit more specifically towards loyalists and loyalism is during the years of the war of independence itself that is to say when you have two sides that are lined up against each other fighting each other it's at least reasonably clear that people are having to make a slightly more definite stand at that point so what was the experience of loyalists during the war itself during the revolution british forces began to seek loyalist help militarily and what they did was is loyalist regiments were organized all over the colonies most were organized and mustered in new york but there were other ones that were raised in georgia they're raised in virginia lord dunmore's is probably the most famous and they used them to fight to fight the british uh, around nineteen thousand troops signed up and it was an, an old william and mary quarterly article by paul smith that put forward that figure and some of them fought all over the colony some of them refused to leave their localities the third battalion of oliver delancey's regiment they didn't want to leave queens they'd refused to leave whereas the second battalion sort of led by john harris kruger they went down to georgia um one thing that was complicated with the loyalist regiments is that the leader or the they were never given the same rank as a british general so Oliver Delancey became Brigadier General. He wasn't General. One thing that strikes me about Loyalist regiments is that there isn't that much research done on them. Since Paul Smith's article, and he, he did a book as, as well, there's been very little research on the muster rolls, on who served, how long did they serve, did they serve with their friends, what happened to them afterwards. But what, what I think happened is that people signed up for lengthy periods of time and some of them were committed soldiers and some of them might have experienced mobility and moved up in their ranks, but they signed up for long periods of time. I think it's particularly interesting that you mention Lord Dunmore's regiment within Loyalists because I think for most people that come across Dunmore's name during the revolution, it's for Dunmore's famous proclamation in 1775 where he offered freedom to any slaves that would rally behind the king's standard and of course this is a very tricky promise for him to give particularly given that he's making that promise whilst basically 
imprisoned on a ship in Williamsburg Harbour. But nevertheless, there are a significant number of slaves who run away from their Virginia masters and do take up this promise of freedom to fight on the British side. And I think it speaks to the variety of motives that have... Um, that animates those that fight on the British side. Alan Taylor has written about this, um, particularly uh, on the War of 1812, but also more generally, that actually when wars were being fought between American and British forces, African-Americans and African-American slaves in particular fought for Britain because they thought that this really did represent the best chance of freedom that they had. And I think that adds to the multiplicity of experiences and identities that really tie people up as loyalists or supporters of Britain within this broader framework that we're talking about. And it's also interesting that of the, the Oaths of Allegiance and the declarations that I found, there's only, out of about 9,000 loyalists, I've only got 11 people that I can identify as, as black and I have no women either. So we talked a little bit about the multiplicity of motivations behind those that joined the loyalist regiments and Chris you raised a really important point which is also the very different treatment that black regiments got compared to white regiments within the British army. But of course loyalists during the war weren't only serving in a military capacity, there were also loyalists that lived and breathed and walked the earth alongside other colonists, alongside those that we would much more comfortably identify as patriots. So what was the effect of the presence of loyalists within broader communities? Well, I mean, in some sense, I think that one of the, one of the major effects was actually the, the displacement that the war had on loyalists. I mean, you know, we'll talk later, I'm sure, about the sort of loyalist diaspora. But during the war, I think the, the displacement had a profound effect. I mean, in the Northeast Atlantic, uh, you know, you have loyalists from all over the region sort of streaming into New York to place themselves under the protection of the British. And I mean, what this did was, I mean, it broke up sort of long-standing communities and uh, brought about a, a sort of reordering of local and social political orders. And this, I think it had an effect on the British's prosecution of the war in the Middle Atlantic, like as I mentioned in New Jersey. Um, but it also had a much longer-term effect on the, the social, political, and, and even economic reorganization um, that happened during the war and especially that followed after the war because by the time the war is over, you effectively had communities that had a significant portion of their uh, hierarchy sort of chopped off, lopped off. And, and in New York, for example, many of the largest merchants were loyalists and their, so their exile after the war creates these sort of economic openings for others as did the, the property seizures of loyalist landholders in, in, in a lot of the colonies. And I think you know, if we were to look further south as well, um, is it Jasanoff that writes that it's in the south that the revolution is closest to a civil war? That yeah, you know, it is. It is much more uh, a much more even split between those that want to stay British and those that that want to break free. And patching up those sorts of really visceral, violent, horrible conflicts that that break out in the South between neighbours and between people within the same community is something that really does take quite a long time to be able to um, to sort out and and heal. And there's a huge amount of distrust. I'm going to run a little bit closer to home in my next comments and talk about Pennsylvania again. But you know, we see in the late 1770s in Pennsylvania, um, and in Philadelphia in particular, the treason trials, where 20-odd people are put on trial for treason, two are convicted um, and sentenced to death. And there's this incredible unease 
Because on the one hand, there is a lust for vengeance on those that were forced to leave their homes and then come back to Philadelphia to find people that had never left and profited reasonably and lived reasonably comfortable lives. But at the same time, there's a fear on the part of many, and by no means only on the part of political elites, that to prosecute too much vengeance against former loyalists will have its own problems, because it means that there's never going to be any sense of social order that comes afterwards. And that sense of unease that you find all over the place really does spring back to this question of loyalty, support, and the the passions that ran very heavily during this period. Of course, while we talk about those who stayed behind after the war, there were also many who didn't, whose response to American independence was to remain British in a very literal sense, not just to harbour nostalgia for the crown, but to actually leave the United States of America and settle elsewhere within the British Empire. That's a movement that's become known as the Loyalist Diaspora. Chris, can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes. Throughout and after the American Revolution, thousands of Loyalists left the United States. It's been estimated recently that around 60 to 100,000 Loyalists left. Uh, this is a huge dislocation of, of people. And they went all over the British Empire. Some went to Great Britain, some went to the Caribbean, most went to the Maritimes, and some ended up, some black loyalists ended in Sierra Leone. They set up new communities, especially in the Maritimes. New Brunswick was founded as a result of loyalist settlement, and people set up new lives, new communities, new political orders that remained loyal to Great Britain. But... You talk of being able to set up new orders in New Brunswick. I mean, clearly there must have been quite a lot of dislocation for these new communities as well, that they've left behind, in many cases, the only place that they've ever called home to set up these new settlements in the Maritimes or to settle elsewhere within the British Empire. What sort of challenges did these people face in setting up their new lives? Well, most if you were moving to to the Maritimes, the weather w was a particularly difficult challenge because the, the last ship left New York at the end of November in seventeen eighty three. Going up to to the Maritimes, it wouldn't have been warm. So the weather it, it sounds basic, but it's a fundamental challenge that they had to overcome. And a lot of people were moving; they had no places to live. They didn't have any houses, so they they stayed literally in in tents. And another thing that was a, was a problem is. They didn't have any money. They'd left their lives behind. Some of them might have been tailors. They might have been skilled artisans who had left everything behind. So they have no money. They have no way to make up for what they'd lost. Now, to try and overcome that, the British government set up a Loyalist Claims Commission. And the Loyalist Claims Commission was a governing body that Loyalists essentially applied for compensation. They showed, or tried to show, the British government, how sort of loyal they were, how much of a loyalist they were in order to get back what they had lost. And they called in witnesses to give testaments of their loyalty and they provided detailed inventories of what they had. Now, the historical use of these can go both ways. They're so detailed that they offer almost a a doomsday book into what who the loyalists were. And doomsday book is how Maya Jasanoff described it. But at the same time, because these people had almost nothing, they're more likely to embellish what they'd written. And now I've been through all the claims for New York, and there are over, over a thousand for New York, and some of the the memorials that loyalists submit are so dramatic and they just seem so unbelievable that they might not actually be true. For example, one loyalist claimed that he sort of hid in a bush for a week to avoid persecution. Now, whether this is true or not, we, we will never know, but it just gives you an insight into how either persecuted loyalists were or how much they embellished their, their compensation claims. The embellishment sort of raises the question of, of how successful were 
these claimants in getting restitution for their or compensation uh, for what they had lost in the revolution. How, how successful were these New York loyalists in petitioning the claims commission? It was extremely rare for loyalists to get as much as they submitted for. So if someone submitted a claim for £1,000, it was very unlikely that they would get £1,000. They would usually get a much smaller figure. Now, it wasn't just male loyalists or white male loyalists that submitted claims. It was female loyalists and black loyalists as well. And they were, because of their gender and their race, they were discriminated against then, in which they rarely, if ever, got anything back. Now, the Loyalists' Claim Commission was in some ways a necessary response to the fact that the British government had been somewhat unable to ensure that the American government had lived up to some of its obligations that were made in the Treaty of Paris. And I start with the Treaty of Paris because there's a perhaps infamous provision within the Treaty of Paris, that the American government was supposed to respect the property rights and the property claims of loyalists before the revolution, that simply supporting the British government during the Revolutionary War wasn't grounds for having your land taken away from you. Of course, American state governments saw this very differently um, for two reasons. One, no government has ever made itself more popular by defending the rights of those who took up arms directly to fight against it. Um, and secondly, the fact that state governments were suffering from incredibly heavy debts in the years immediately following the war. And one of the most readily available assets that they had at their disposal was land that had been seized from those that had supported British forces during the war. And so one of the things that I think is really important in thinking about loyalism as an enduring phenomenon isn't just looking at the loyalist diaspora, but it's also looking at the effects that loyalism has back in America more specifically. And one area that we clearly see this is in those land seizures, is in the way that state governments do appropriate this land, do sell it off to their own population. Because not only is this an important way of trying to put the new state governments on any sort of consistent and stable footing, um, but it also has a lasting impact on relationships between the American and the British governments. One of the issues that becomes a sticking point in the Jay Treaty by the time of the Jay Treaty negotiations is the question of the British maintaining military outposts in Western American lands. And the justification that the British use for maintaining the military outposts is, well, you didn't respect our property rights um, in terms of the land seizure. So why on earth should we care about your claims to have a right to access these military posts? And so with that question of land seizure, we can see some very definite effects that trying to deal with the question of loyalism at home affects American politics for at least the next decade. You know, we're, we're talking about material compensation and restitution. There is also this sort of process of uh, intellectual restitution that goes on in uh, loyalist histories of the revolution. And, and I've been working on this a little bit um, lately. And I mean, in some sense, you know, for patriot uh, historians after the revolution, the revolution was this sort of triumph of uh, virtue over the corrupted, right, of local republicanism over distant monarchy of citizens over subjects and, and mercenaries. But the loyalist historians saw and wrote the revolution quite differently. Uh, I, I think you can say that the loyalist historians generally, one of the things about them is that they, they assigned blame widely, right? They blamed the colonists, of course, for uh, being overzealous Republicans, and they, they blamed uh, the colonial elite specifically for being demagogues and appealing to such a mob. But they also blamed Britain as well. And for them, I think, you know, Britain had failed on a number of fronts. And as some of these historians actually, uh, for them, Britain had basically failed in almost every aspect of the conflict. It failed to create stronger imperial institutions in the colonies. 
Uh, it had mismanaged the empire, failed to govern the colonies in a reasonable manner. And then in war, it chose incompetent commanders. And there's a sort of distinct bitterness that runs through the loyalist histories, as you might well imagine. There's a, a bitterness over the immediate impact of the events, but also of the long-term perception of the cause, right? I mean, they knew that history is written by the winners and that posterity would likely not treat them kindly. And in 1779, even before the war is over, and is actually still very much in the balance, Jonathan Boucher, an Angli Anglican clergyman in Maryland, wrote that if the history of the last four years was now written 50 years from now, it would be set down as marvelous and romantic. And uh, so I think that what sticks out most to me about these histories is that, one, they, they blamed both sides, and uh, B, they were writing for a posterity which they were almost certain would ignore them. But the, in a sense, the sheer magnitude of the defeat in their minds required them to at least try and salvage something, some kind of uh, dignity. This is what I mean by uh, intellectual restitution uh, and the desperation and the uncertainty that they faced in this post-revolutionary world uh, basically drips off the pages of these works. Well, you're almost getting an 18th century version of how long can you continue to ask people to die for a mistake, aren't you? That, you know, for so much to have been invested in a cause that ultimately rests on ideas of the proper, the proper locus of governance um, and that causes such a, as we've discussed today, that causes such a political, physical, um, emotional connection to to those political movements that's got to be something that's incredibly difficult to to move away from and incredibly difficult to justify yeah absolutely i, I you know what i think even though they're they're writing you know they or, or they contend to write you know a broader history of the of the conflict of the revolution you know what you what you what you get from it the sense that you get from it of the historians as individuals is that you know this is the defining event of their lives and they lost right and and that is something that it's that they themselves have to come to terms with right and often you see that working itself out in the pages of their histories and yes it's just this one person uh that's that's writing whatever specific history it is but you 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 under you, you get a sense of how you know that that had to also be the sense for for the tens of thousands of loyalists that ended up having to be exiled. So I want to pivot a little bit here and talk about those who, for whatever reason, weren't able to leave North America at the end of the War of Independence. You know, clearly there are those who harboured, whether it's loyalist sympathies or who actively aided the British forces during the Revolutionary War, who do stay behind in North America who do ultimately decide that they're going to make their peace with the newly independent state governments, the newly independent national governments, and try and continue their lives within America, even though they have spent previous times fighting quite so bitterly against the creation of those very governments. And that does cause an awful lot of problems. I'll talk about Pennsylvania because it's the area that, that I know best, but the spectre of the revolution hangs over Pennsylvanian politics for quite a long time, not least because the revolutionary government instituted a set of oaths of allegiance in 1776, in which you had to swear to um, or affirm your allegiance and to uphold the new constitution. And there are many that refuse to do this, even if they're trying to live regular lives. And it's not actually until 1786 that Quakers in Pennsylvania re-engage with state politics once the test sack test acts have basically fallen out of use um, once they once it's basically become clear that they're not something that the constitutionalists can can easily defend but that means that for quite a long period of time they're literally written out of the political community that if you will not take the oath of allegiance to Pennsylvania you cannot exercise almost any sort of civil right within the state and 
that's obviously a huge source of tension. Now, clearly, if you're a wealthy Quaker merchant in Philadelphia, the loss of some civil rights is probably not going to affect you too much. But it's definitely a cause of instability within the within the new state government. And I think that's one of the things that scholarly literature is turning towards and is something that really does need to be explored in more detail is you know, if we're looking at these people that were connected with the British in some way during the war, that is a very tricky element to reassimilate and to reintegrate back into politics. And the way and quite frankly, the ways in which state governments deal with that is very haphazard and really does emphasize one key theme of the 1780s, which is the extent to which Americans were really making it up as they went along. There was no blueprint and they almost had to do it on a women of prayer to to try and manage to keep some of these potentially volatile forces together. For me, what would be really interesting is a comparative study of loyalists who left and loyalists who stayed. And to see if you if it can be measured the extent to which loyalism affected their lives. And or to take it one step further, is whether people left in distinct social groups, like they left with their friends and their family, and if people stayed with their friends and their family, and how that affected the rest of their that lives. That sounds like an excellent second book, Chris. I'm looking forward to reading it. <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on it. So I think that brings us to our final topic of the day, which is how we might think about approaching teaching loyalism within the classroom. Michael, do you have any particular sources or any particular approaches that you like to use when talking about the question of loyalism? Well, I think in terms of uh, sources, or, or I think at least my favorite source, I think has to be the sort of the the list that Thomas Hutchinson draws up of all the property that he had damaged in the attack on his home. Right, so his home was attacked by a mob in Boston just before the Stamp Act went into effect, and this was in August of 1765. And this, this mob basically destroyed um, most of the property in the house. He had, you know, Hutchinson was a historian, and he had been collecting papers, historical papers having to do with Massachusetts going back to the 17th century, and those were destroyed. But a lot of his personal belongings, and he was preparing, he prepared a list to be submitted uh to the British government for compensation, I, maybe in some sense the, the first loyalist claim, uh, and uh, in it's a it's a multi-page list, and it basically lists all the everything that was destroyed. And I mean, I, I think in some sense, you know, you combine that with uh, a few of the letters that he wrote around the time. There's one specifically that he wrote uh, to Richard Jackson. I mean, it, Hutchinson probably never comes across as less aloof or a, or as more human than when he's writing about uh, this attack on his home. And when you see the list of belongings, I mean, you know, you get a sense of the real, the the, the personal loss. The, the, I mean, it's not it's property, right? But I mean, people have connections to their possessions, to their home, and 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 so I mean, you get a sense of of the sort of devastation that could be. Uh, uh, wrecked on people uh, from uh, positions taken in support of the crown. Obviously, this is over 10 years before independence, but it's still, uh, I think, a similar uh, situation. And, uh, you know, it, it drives home the fact that, you know, we say loyalists. We say loyalists all the time, loyalists this, loyalists that. And, and in some sense, you have to do that when you're teaching a, a survey because you have such limited time, right, that you can't get lost in the weeds. But you know, it, it's one way to bring home the fact that, you know, loyalists were not just some faceless group. These were people who really had uh, who, who, who paid significant personal uh, costs for, for the, the way that they found themselves aligned in the political situation of the times. For me, I've mentioned the, the Oaths of Allegiance and Loyalist Declarations earlier, but the best example that I like to use in teaching is... Historians call it the Declaration of Dependence. Now, it's in the, the collections of the New York Historical Society, and it's a very large, imposing document. It's probably about three to four feet by about two, three feet 
It's a huge document with a real physical presence, and it has this huge preamble written by Charles Ingalls that pledges allegiance to King George III, the restoration of British government, and underneath this lengthy preamble, there are over 900 names. And this document was left in a tavern in New York City in November 1776 for three days, and colonists just came in and out as they went to sign their names. And as you go through the names, you can see as prominent New Yorkers. There's people like Frederick Phillips, Oliver Delancey are signing it. But alongside their names, there are lesser known New Yorkers that people don't know so much about. But there's people like Frederick Rhinelander or Ebert Banker Jr. They sign them as well. What's equally sort of important about this document is that no women signed it. And of the Oaths of Allegiance that I've looked at and all the other declarations that I've looked at, which is collectively around 9,000 loyalists, I've never identified a woman signing one of these documents. And that's really interesting in itself. And that's something to bring up when I'm teaching in class is why weren't women allowed to sign these documents? And by doing that, it allows you to touch upon sort of loyalism and women, loyalism, gender, and then loyalism and race. Because out of all the 9,000 loyalists I have, there are only 11 people that I can identify definitively as being black because they were segregated in one of the oaths of allegiance and in all the other ones they are not because it's almost impossible to identify someone's race just through their name. So that's something that I like to approach loyalism through these documents. And that sounds a really good way of emphasising both the inclusions and the exclusions of loyalist political culture. And I think what both of you have talked about there is not just about bringing in individual stories, but also showing that really these people are parts of communities, whether they be defined as loyalist communities or whether we look at the other links that they have to the broader communities that allows you to really draw out some of the complications of what we've talked about earlier on defining a loyalist and defining loyalism more generally. Um, because that's certainly something I find in in my teaching is that I'm having enough of a struggle at times just to get people to think of the varieties of patriot activity that to then throw in that sort of you know the the cartoonish bad guys are also considerably more complicated can sort of come in and be a lesson that almost doesn't hold because it's difficult enough to get across enough of a rethinking of the revolution in everything else that you're doing to really get across that complication in loyalism. And to me, the issue always comes back to that earlier question of if you didn't actually leave the British Empire or you didn't fight for the British army, who were you loyal to? You know, what is the value of that tag loyalism or loyalist? if it doesn't refer to resettlement or enlistment in the army. And that means that that's a slightly different question from that which I'm normally exploring as one of the the key themes in the revolution. But I I really like the approach that both of you are taking with those with those sources that you've talked about. Well, that's all that we've got time for on the Junto cast today. So that leaves me to thank Michael. Thank you, Ken. And to thank Chris. Thank you, Ken. For joining me here on the podcast today. At this point, I want to make a special request that if you can go and find the Junto Cast page in iTunes and leave us a rating and a review, because that really helps other people find the Junto Cast when they're looking for history podcasts within the iTunes store. Now that I have that desperate pleading out of the way, the Junto cast is a production of bloggers at earlyamericanists.com. And if you visit the website, we will have a special post up for this edition of the podcast where we will have suggestions for further reading on the topic of loyalism. If you've got any feedback on what you've heard today, you can email us at thejuntoblog at gmail.com or you can find us on Twitter at JuntoCast. You can also find our Facebook page by searching for The JuntoCast, 
And as I mentioned earlier, we are also available in the iTunes store. Please do leave us a rating or a review. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Junto Cast, and we hope that you'll join us for the next episode. God save our gracious king, long live our noble king. Rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. Britons never ever ever shall be slaves. Land of hope and glory, mother of the free. Ha 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 